All right. So I'd like to introduce my friend and collaborator, John Gordon, who's a physician scientist and has a new lab at UCSF. And John uses uh, very sophisticated proteomics and chemical biology approaches to tackle uh, problems in liver cancer. So welcome, John. Thank you very much. And um, in terms of the, the information that you're asking for from your, uh, from your co-organizer, co um, it, it is understood that a, a group of people will have to leave at noon for the ICRN meeting, and so um, I promise not to personalize it, and um, th those who can will stay behind for questions. Um, is there a laser pointer up here, by the way? Uh, yes, sir. Sorry. Great. Um, so as, as Nabil mentioned, my name is John Gordon. I'm a medical oncologist at UCSF. I treat patients with cholangiocarcinoma and other liver cancers. And I think that the, uh, the project I want to tell you about today is motivated by um, really, you know, the, the excitement of targets like FGFR and IDH, for example, which we'll hear about after lunch, coupled to the fact that actually there are many patients where we don't have an exciting molecular target and how I've been trying to take the tools that I use in the lab to study a number of different biological questions to define new molecular targets where the genetics don't lead us. Um, and, you know, I, I, I had to choose um, which of the major contributors to cholangiocarcinoma genomics whose data I would not show, since so many of them are in the room. But what I'm just showing you here is the simplified schematic of um, the results from a Japanese study completed in 2015 where I've circled in red are actionable mutations. And it's such a, such a great good fortune to me as a physician that over the time that I've been treating cholangiocarcinoma, we've seen drugs for FGFR2 and IDH, and now I think targeting the DNA damage response starting to come online in this disease. And these are fundamentally transformative, but they're not transformative for everybody. And so what I'm trying to do is take a different approach to understand how there might be things that are intrinsic to the biology of cholangiocytes that we can target therapeutically instead. And so what I'm showing you here is actually a, a, a stain that I did for another project, but it was just so striking that to a certain extent is behind a lot of what I'm doing here with cholangiocarcinoma. So this is a section of uh, not liver tumor, but actually just regular liver. Uh, the pathologists in the room will notice it's a little scarred. Um, it's from someone who had hepatitis C. But what you can see here is we've stained it for nuclei, which you see here in bright blue. We've stained it for a transcription factor, which is relevant in the liver, called beta-catenin, which you can see in red in the hepatocytes. And then we've stained it for something called YAP, which stands for the YES-associated protein. It's a transcriptional coactivator, which is, um, as you can see, highly enriched in this bile duct and actually has been shown by a number of people to be essential for cholangiocyte proliferation. So YAP is the um, terminal effector of a pathway which is known as HIPPO. Uh, for people who haven't been operating in research biology for, for a while, whenever you see a pathway with a really weird name, that's probably because it was discovered in a fruit fly. And so if you, if you eliminate this pathway in fruit flies, I guess in some weird way they come out looking like HIPPOs. Um, I've never actually seen a picture of that. But what I'm showing you here over on the right, uh, on my right, um, is, a, um, is a picture of a fruit fly where the hippo pathway, which again is the pathway upstream of this target yap that I'm focusing on, is inactivated. And so you see it's got these sort of warty tumor-like growths coming off of it. And this is the result of the loss of a specific signal of contact inhibition. So normally our tissues know when to stop growing. This is enforced by the hippo pathway. And this is particularly important in the liver and bile duct because the liver is actually the only, one of the only regenerative solid organs, and so if you cut out part of the liver, much of it will grow back, and it has to know when to stop, and that's from the hippo pathway. And cancer is, in a large extent, cells not knowing when to stop, so this seems like a very reasonable target. And indeed, there's data that, in the interest of time, I'll gloss over just showing that not only is YAP activated in the bile ducts, but it's in fact hyperactivated in cholangiocarcinoma as compared to the bile ducts. So this seems like a good target, but how do we get after it? And so what I'm showing you here is, is as complicated as it seems, a relatively simplified form, format of the pathway. It's classically divided into two modules. Um, one module, which is regulated by kinase signaling, so traditional signal transduction, 
through these hippokinases. They're called um, MST1 and 2 in mammals because we don't like to name things after animals as much. Um, and they signal through a kinase called LATS to regulate, again, YAP shown here. And essentially, when this part of the hippo pathway is on, YAP is pulled out of the nucleus and transcription does not happen. There's an alternative pathway which is driven by protein-protein interactions where a family of scaffolding proteins called angiomotins sequester YAP out of the nucleus and complex with something called NF2. Interestingly, both NF2 and this protein here called Salvador are, consider are bona fide tumor suppressors, and the uh, TCGA report that came out last year demonstrated inactivating mutations of each of these. Um, as a side point, when you look at this TCGA report, if you just um, create a scatter plot with a relative expression of each target, you can see that there seem to be some of the tumors that were defined where there's a great deal of NF2 expression and very little Salvador and vice versa, suggesting that actually perhaps both parts of this pathway don't operate at once, although that's conjecture. So this is something that I'm trying to tackle in my lab, and we're taking a three-pronged strategy. The story I'm going to tell you today is work that we've done with an established compound that was originally developed for colon cancer, something called a tankerase inhibitor, which does have activity towards this pathway. Um, one of the other points of interest is looking at these loss of function mutations in NF2 and Salvador and how we can identify currently available therapeutics that they sensitize tumor cells for uh, response to. And finally, we're trying to develop new, new mechanisms to target this pathway, although um, perhaps groups, companies like Dr. Hammerman's will beat us to the punch. Um, and again, the story I'm going to focus on today is how we can reactivate HIPPO using these compounds called tankerase inhibitors. And I want to quickly show you where they fit into the pathway. So it turns out that if this schema wasn't complicated enough, there's actually a second point of contact with, with YAP, which is through, um, through the beta-catenin beta pathway. And so this is a pathway which is mutationally inactivated in colon cancer in almost 100 percent of them. And so over the last decade, a number of different pharmaceutical companies have developed a class of drugs that stabilize this protein axon, which is necessary for the degradation of beta-catenin and YAP. And they actually also stabilize this protein called these angiomotin proteins. And this is because they're both marked for degradation by a PARP family member called tankerase. And so there are a number of different compounds in this class that have been developed over time. They're all tool compounds. These are not available for human use. And part of the goal, one of the goals of this project is actually to make it into something that is potentially exciting enough for a company to move forward. So we can use these compounds in vitro, and we can show that, in fact, they stabilize angiomotins and that they interact with YAP. So we have a drug that at least works in our hands. And we find that in a subset of cholangiocarcinoma cell lines, they're as sensitive to these drugs as, in fact, the sort of exemplar colon cancer line. So we think we're on to a potential, in, potential pathway of relevance in cholangiocarcinoma. Um, it does affect the transcription of YAP targets. And again, in the interest of time, I'm going to gloss over this, but we very carefully had to piece out whether we were hitting beta-catenin transcription or YAP transcription, which we've done through a series of loss, loss of function assays showing that, in fact, angiomotins are required for inhibition of cell proliferation in cholangiocytes or cholangiocarcinoma cell models, as is the HIPPO pathway member NF2. So we think we really are hitting the pathway here. As one might have expected, we don't see a genetic marker. This is from sequencing all of the cell lines that we studied that predict for drug sensitivity. And so we instead turn to one of the proteomic techniques that we've been applying to a number of sort of more traditional kinase signaling models, um, wherein we use um, kinase inhibitors in linked to sephiros to preferentially a purify active kinases from a cell lysate that we can then read out by quantitative proteomics. And when we looked across our cholangiocarcinoma cell line panel, if we organize them based on, based on their sensitivity to the tankerase inhibitor, we found that the vast majority of the, or we found that the cells that were sensitive to the tankerase inhibitor also showed signs of a mesenchymal or invasive-like phenotype. And if you look at these at the level of mesenchymal markers, we found that indeed they overexpressed a marker of a mesenchymal phenotype called CDH2. This is a cadherin protein, as well as a transcription factor that drives EMT in a subset of cases, something called ZEB1. And once again, if we use loss of function to inactivate these, we can block the effect of the drug. Um, it's important to note we haven't been able to do the reverse experiment yet, where we turn these pathways back on and make the drug work better. That is essential for this work to move forward. 
Um, but in the last couple of seconds, I just want to, about 35 seconds, um, show you something that we've come on recently that's, just, that's pretty exciting, which is that um, since all of this is involved in EMT or in, in tumor cell invasion, and we know that tumor cell invasion is a huge problem in cholangiocarcinoma as these tumors invade in the liver in ways that can be very difficult and frequently stop us from being able to do surgeries that would otherwise be potentially curative. We looked at a couple of different assays to see if, in fact, the drugs that we were using to reduce proliferation could also reduce invasion. Uh, this is something called a scratch assay, where you grow cells to confluence, then you tear across the plate and watch them grow back. And in fact, we found that in several models, we were able to reduce the rate of regrowth to an extent that was um, much greater than the effect on proliferation, suggesting that we might actually have a better mechanism here. Um, we can all, this is some very preliminary data showing that we can also reduce invasion into matrigel. And so in summary, I think what we found is that small molecule reactivation of HIPPO is feasible. Tank race inhibitors are a possible path forward, although again, these are not, these are currently only tool compounds and are not available for human use. And we've been able to identify a phenotype rather than a genotype that underlies drug sensitivity. And in fact, based on this phenotype, we were able to identify a second activity of these drugs towards invasion rather than proliferation. So this is something we'd certainly like to look at further. And finally, I just want to thank the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation for supporting this work, my collaborators, and the members of my group, particularly Alex Choi, who's taken point on this work. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the great talk, John. And uh, before we take the Q&A, I should have mentioned earlier that both Lipica and John were recipients of career development awards from, from the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation. And tomorrow you'll be hearing from another winner, uh, Angela Lamarca. And so I also welcome, uh, encourage you to look on the website if you have young trainees uh, for next year's competition. Uh, the due date is uh, April 1st, and you'll see that on the website. So with that, uh, let's open this for a discussion.